march of time. In Moscow and other great cities of the Soviet Union, the war day begins at dawn with the lowering of the friendly balloon barrage that gave protection through the night. This one day of war in Russia differs little from yesterday or tomorrow, but for the fact that it is to be recorded for history by 160 official cameramen of the Soviet Army and Navy, from the Arctic to the Caucasus, from the Western Front to the Bering Sea. It is not yet six in the morning, but a detachment of troops under the command of Major Bielkin is photographed on its way to the front. Now in its second year is this gigantic city. In this struggle, all of Russia is the battleground. All its cities are fortresses. All its people are combatants. For more than a year, the enemy has ravaged much of the Soviet's richest and most productive territory. But for every inch of ground the fascist enemy has taken, he has paid recklessly at the hands of the Russian people, who with matchless bravery and devotion have risen as one, fighting civilians, fighting soldiers, fighting sailors and marines, men and women who have not been afraid to die for the land they love. From the northernmost point of the Russian front, deep within the Arctic Circle, one cameraman reports the beginning of a fighting day. The event of the morning is a skirmish between Soviet ski troops on reconnaissance and enemy snipers. Before the impersonal eye of the camera, death seems almost matter of fact. Suffering becomes unreal and remote. On this day of war, beleaguered Leningrad, like Stalingrad, tells to the camera its epic story of siege, of indomitable resistance. The camera can show but little of the suffering and death and horror that have reigned upon this heroic city in the long months during which the Nazis have vainly smashed at Leningrad's gates. But it is people, the Russian people, who tell in truest terms what depths of fortitude underlie their heroic resistance to the invaders. In the Black Sea, in the Baltic, and in the Barents Sea, 
The Red Navy is seeing battle action on this morning of war. Aboard a submarine commanded by Captain Ivan Kalishkin is official photographer Oshurkov, one of the 160 cameramen covering this typical day of war. no camera can ever record is the immense size of the Soviet Union, comprising more than one-sixth of all the land in all the world. On this day of war, a half dozen cameramen are assigned to Russia's capital city, unconquered Moscow. For the capital of a great nation battling for its existence, Moscow seems strikingly calm and quietly efficient. At midday, one camera catches a group of RAF flyers on a sightseeing tour of the city. At noon, Vyacheslav Molotov, Commissar of Foreign Affairs, returns from a mission abroad. And in the Kremlin, Premier Joseph Stalin talks to members of the Supreme Soviet. In the Hall of Rewards, Soviet Airman Bondarenko and two others are decorated for valor in battle. Afterwards, at the Café National, where it is sometimes possible to dine in pre-war style, the three newest Soviet heroes celebrate their awards. Twenty-two-year-old tank leader Viktor Grigoriev has killed 200 Germans and put 10 Nazi tanks out of action. 6,000 miles from Moscow, farther than from New York to Honolulu, on this same day, an Amur River gunboat squadron is patrolling the waters which separate Russian Siberia from Japanese-held Manchukuo. Off Kamchatka, but a few hundred miles from U.S. territory, vessels of the Soviet fishing fleet are being partially manned by women to help bolster the nation's food supply. In remote Kazakhstan and in the Caucasus, this day of war is but another day of service in the field for the farmers and herdsmen who know that the fight for food is the fight for victory. Today, they must work harder than ever to make up for the loss of rich land still occupied by the enemy. This harvest scene from central Russia could be duplicated hundreds of thousands of times across the broad plains of the Soviet Union. A cameraman has journeyed to a distant Abhazian tea plantation where women are gathering the crop which means so much to every Russian. Whatever can be gathered from Russia's farms must flow together in a single stream to nourish, first of all, Soviet fighters. In making their film record of an average day of war, Soviet cameramen do not neglect the heroes behind the fighting fronts, such as oil field workers, who are increasing by every means at their command, Russia's output of one of the vital elements of modern war. The Soviet Union officially recognizes and honors those workers who by skill, initiative, and hard work beat production quotas. At the Karaganda mine in shaft number 20, driller Stepanov has exceeded his quota by 500%. In Russia's industrial offensive, women do everything that men are doing, in mine and mill and factory. Miles within the interior and removed beyond the reach of the enemy, 
This industrial area in the Urals is serving well the purpose for which it was built. Spread out from Magnitogorsk in scores of other cities, which for military reasons must be unnamed, are the factories where Russian workers are doggedly pounding out the weapons for their fighting men who are engaging a powerful and well-equipped enemy along an 1,800-mile battlefront, longer than from East Port, Maine to Key West, Florida. The front needs it. We will do it, is the fighting slogan of Soviet workers for every day of war. Each worker feels deeply and personally that this is his war, that he and his fellow workers have a vested interest in their shop and their jobs, and that with these goes the responsibility for maintaining and increasing the total output, so that with the weapons they make, more of the hated enemy may be killed. And through long months of peril, the tradition has been maintained that it is as unthinkable for a workman to desert his bench as for a soldier to leave his post. Scores of these factories and shops, photographed on this typical day of war in Russia, were moved in their entirety. Lathes, drills, and forges, from their original locations in areas now occupied by the enemy or dangerously near the battlefront. The camera's record of this day of war finds all able-bodied Russians, men and women, mobilized for war. After the working day is over, millions of Russians put in even more hours learning the tactics of hand-to-hand -hand fighting so that they can serve usefully either in the army or as guerrillas. A cameraman has gotten through to the village of Orlov, where Soviet guerrillas, Russia's partisans, are carrying on the kind of warfare that is striking at the enemy behind his own lines. In this village, old Vasily, the cabinet maker, has taken it upon himself to make gun stocks for all his neighbors. No one told him to do it. It's his contribution to victory. In the early afternoon, Partisans surprise a mixed detachment of Hungarians and Germans, kill a hundred of them and free the village. After the enemy is driven out, the villagers and partisans deal with a traitor a man known to have sold information to the Nazis. Other cameramen on this day photograph scenes at advanced air fighter and bomber stations. From Moscow to entertain the flyers has come the noted pianist, Emil Gilyels. afternoon offensive on the Western Front, enemy installations are bombed heavily. One of the Soviet cameramen goes into battle and films an encounter between a Russian fighter and a German Junker.
But it is with the fighting troops who are mounting the great Russian offensive on the long western battlefront that most of the 160 Soviet cameramen see action on this typical day of war. A day which brings death to many photographers as well as soldiers. The Soviet general in command has ordered a counterattack as reconnaissance reveals the approach of an enemy panzer division. tanks and troops. is caught by surprise. A well-placed hit disables the Nazi tank. The camera catches its crew in a futile effort to escape. soldiers go, with them go the Soviet's women nurses, like Sasha Sokolova, who has been under fire constantly since the war began. She has saved hundreds of wounded men. Shortly before sundown, the battle reaches the height of its intensity. This Nazi equipment will never again fight for ahead are Nazi anti-tank guns firing at point-blank range. But Soviet tanks are undamaged and race ahead. For these Nazis who once dreamed of conquering and ruling all the world, the war has ended. On other similar days of war, more fascists have died violently and terribly. Whole armies of the dead who will never march against British Tommies or American doughboys. For the defense of their homeland, the Russian people have paid in suffering, sacrifice, and death to a degree almost beyond human conception. And without this defense, without this sacrifice, the armies of Hitler and his fascist satellites might long ago have been masters of all Europe, all Asia, and all Africa. Almost the last scene photographed on this day of war is the personal sacrifice of one young Soviet flyer, who, mortally wounded, attempted to bring back his plane safely. Никогда не запутают нашего воскушного богатыря. Thus, a day much like any other day of war in Russia comes to its end. Just ahead is the night in which there may be more fighting. The Russian people, soldiers and civilians are ready. They will keep fighting because this is their homeland. Because they love Russia. They love it as the English love England as the American people love and believe in America. Time marches on. Time marches on.